Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I would like to return to Simple Rockets, to a game that I've been playing on and off for the last 18 months and haven't covered nearly as much as it deserves, largely because, well, it's not Kerbal Space Program. But for many of you out there, not being Kerbal Space Program is really an advantage. I'll be clear, Simple Rockets offers a lot of things that Kerbal doesn't, and it doesn't have little green men and women as astronauts. As you may have noticed, this is something that resembles Tintin's rocket. Uh, it's not actually Tintin's rocket because I understand that that one was nuclear powered. This one is just pre propelled by, you know, standard chemical fuel. But it does give you a great example of how the, how the engine, how the design tools let you kind of build whatever you want. I've been wanting to do a history of the Delta rockets for a very long time. I had at one point the idea to try building all the evolution of the Delta using simple rockets because the great thing is that you can put in the tank and then stretch the tank, you can retexture the tank. It's not like Kerbal Space Program where you have a fixed number of pieces that you can assemble, you can clip through, but you can't adjust the size of any of them. In Simple Rockets, their philosophy is to have a small number of parts that are highly customizable. So not only did I get those tanks and make them the correct length, I also added a tank in the middle and then textured it differently to make it look like the interstage between the kerosene and the oxygen tank. The engine on there is almost the same size as the actual engine on the original Thor rocket. This may look like I've put a fair amount of attention to detail, but you know what? This is nothing compared to some of the hardcore players that have worked on this. For example, we have this uh, rather fine record version of a Gemini rocket here. Hey, I think the textures and everything look rather nice, all this, but you know what? We have various camera views and one of them is in the cockpit. <laughs> and I think I want you to appreciate this, you have a couple of crew members in here. Now this isn't a cockpit that comes with the game, this is actually something that the player that shared on Steam literally built. This is a tiny fuel tank here. This, <laughs> like, and and what's best of all is you can actually see, you know, uh, exhaust coming out of these because these are reaction control thrusters that they've added. Uh, I'm sure this rocket is coming out of control. Oh, there we go. Cinematic view as it flies past. Isn't that beautiful? Not that we're going to be tracking their particular performance because. I was just wanting you to, to see just how beautiful some of these creations are. But I really want to go into the engine designer. So you have a few basic engines in the game, so we can get the mage engine. Drag that, drop that on there. Sure, that looks nice. You've got, uh, you know, your thrust vector and control. And as I said, everything is tweakable. And I mean everything. If you select the engine, we can start adjusting it. We can say, ah, actually, we don't like the gas generator design. We want a beefier gas generator. We want to have staged combustion. Or we want that full flow staged combustion. That's right. Oh, yeah, there's the beauty of it. And perhaps we want a Methalox full flow staged combustion. Now, note when I'm adjusting this to hydrogen, for example, the mass of the entire vehicle drops, whereas kerosene, it's much heavier. That's because it's adjusting the contents of this tank. So you're working with the various trade-offs with the engine designs. Um, there's also, you can have solid boosters, you can have nuclear thermal, and uh, yeah, so those are your main types there. There's also electric engines in there. Another pump uh, variety they have, they obviously have pressure fed and they have electric if you want to go the rocket lab route. You can tweak the bell size and that will of course change the way this performs. And yes, you have a fine little performance analyzer here as you start tweaking around with your engine settings. Maybe you want to build a vacuum engine by making that longer and that short, your nozzle a bit tighter. Maybe you want to fly with an aero spike. There are all the options that you could possibly have here. So I guess what I'm saying is that there's a lot of real science going into this. This is very basic you know, math where you're taking the throat size, the nozzle length and the ambient pressure and the chamber pressure and you're figuring out the actual performance, especially when you know your chemistry type and you know, the efficiency of your pumps and everything. So you, c you can essentially build whatever you need for whatever rocket you need. And then of course you can save these parts 
and use them to build whatever rocket you want. I'm going to say this massive engine bell does look kind of ridiculous, so I think we should fly it and see what happens. After all, it's what Jebediah would do. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. Truly a thing of art for the five or six seconds that it actually flies. And now, of course, it's going to fall back to the planet. And that thing is not going to really act as much of a parachute, but it might act as a bit of a shock absorber. After all, those engine bells are pretty good crumple zones if you think about it. Well, so much for the crumple zones. So one of the big features that Simple Rockets has added, which is not in stock Kerbal Space Program, is the ability to program your parts. And it's pretty much a language that looks a lot like Scratch. It's all dragging blocks together. And yes, that means for many people it's easier, it's less intimidating. But on the other hand, it does mean that everything does seem to pay, take a little longer than it would be if I was typing it in. Each to his own for sure. So this is a fairly, you know, fairly complicated script. It actually started out quite simple and then I expanded it and added it. So there's a bunch of things to realize. You have your standard control flow statements here. You have mathematical functions which can be used in uh, these blocks inside your if-then loops or whatever. You have a bunch of functions to activate controls to this craft and you can lock the heading or set your time or set your camera and move all this stuff. That's great. And then you also have a bunch of information that uh, you can read from the environment. For example, you can read your, well, velocity here, by the way, acceleration and gravity are in here. So if you want to read your, your gravity, you read it from that. Uh, there are events and events can be used to trigger new sections of code. So you can have multiple sections running in parallel. One example might be your core program might just be an event loop which broadcasts messages to subloops and then they do all their thing. You can create variables which are pretty easy. You see I've used these in a few places just as gatekeepers. Um, and this is of course the list version of the variable, that's fine. But custom expressions are kind of basically variables that are smart. Every time you call them they do all this math for you. And, uh, you know, so you can then use this in your calculations here, there. I don't know where I've actually used it. Yeah, you can use your sh stopping altitude as using my stopping time calculation and so on and so forth. And also you can do custom instructions, which are just like, you know, subroutines. They can't return values, but you can return values through these, you know, global variables. So, for example, in this loop here, I pulled out the set the landing thrust and set landing attitude into two separate functions here. So these are sort of working. They're largely a bunch of heuristics combined with a bunch of math. So let's actually see this fly. Now this is going to start out on the moon, then fly down range all on its own without me touching the controls. And then it's going to land. So let's bring up the velocity information. Let's bring up the average AGL, average ground level thing, altitude. Yeah, it's, it's looking pretty nice. Got that little engine running there. You'll notice that the exhaust is more realistic. This is a vacuum, so the exhaust spreads out into a wide angle and, of course, stops because I turned off the engine. And this is one of the electrically pumped thrusters as well using kerosene and liquid oxygen, which is why we have the insulation. So this thing is going to go upwards, and once it starts, the vertical velocity starts dropping down, it'll kick in its landing routine. Right now, it's sort of at the apex, so it's designed to just sort of hold a vertical attitude and wait for itself to figure out where it's going to land. Once the velocity drops below minus 20 meters per second, it'll start trying to figure out when it should fire its engine. So those two numbers up the top, those are from me. The first one is the altitude at which it thinks it needs to begin on its braking burn so that it stops just above the surface. The second number is the acceleration after gravity has been subtracted. So these were just numbers that I used when debugging the system. So AGL is going to get equal to that and then we're going to start firing our engines and we'll start decelerating. Now I added, added in a little bit of um, fudge factor, a little bit of slop into this just to make sure it doesn't stop too late because stopping too late is a lot worse than stopping too early. And yeah, now it's it's just jumping around and trying to seek the correct attitude, the correct thrust. 
Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, look, it's doing attitude control and it's doing thrust control all the way down. And, and I think that's not bad. I mean, obviously a big part of that was the engine delay in responding. If I pro coded that up with a proper PID controller, then we might have, you know, better performance, better stability, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it still worked pretty well. Now, I guess it flew, how far did it go downrange? Yeah, you know, fair distance downrange, all completely automated. So look, I largely wanted to bring attention to this game that I've sort of been ignoring and I, I've sort of been guilty because it really perhaps deserves more of your attention. I know Kerbal is still really the definitive game for many, Orbiter is the sim that works for many other people. This uh, works very well for people that are, say, using iPads because you can actually use it on those. The user interface for building is... it requires a lot of patience. But you can do it all, it is fully featured and it's quite capable. You can certainly get the PC version if that's what you want. If you don't like little green men, then again, Simple Rockets is perfect for you. If you want to build things that look like real rockets, it's pretty good at that. I will say that the planet sizes are still small, the orbital velocity around the home planet is 3.5 kilometers per second, so it's bigger than Kerbin, uh, Kerbal planets, but still way smaller than the real thing. I will say I still have a lot of problems with the control scheme. It's great that you can, you know, push the buttons, press W, A, S, D and fly things, but the na lack of a nav ball it was a real killer for me. I get confused all the time and the one that they project on the screen frequently doesn't work very well. Also, the autopilot in many situations is inferior to my hand input controls like so there's times where if I wish I had better feedback so I could fly it better but hey look we've got gorgeous planets like this with rings but it does look to me like those rings are inclined to the equatorial bands or you know the gas atmospheric bands and that shouldn't happen because those are a sign of the rotational axis and the rotational axis creates the bulge and the bulge causes anything in orbit to precess. So rings which would be inclined to that would break up and reform along the equator. So yeah, future you know, reference for you sci-fi people, always make sure the rings of your planets are aligned with the atmospheric bands on the planets. Unless you have some other magic that's holding the rings in the correct orientation. But anyway, after about 18 months, Simple Rockets 2 really has pushed itself to a point where it is worth reckon, uh, recommending. Uh, I mean, that is, you know, obviously Kerbal is still the one which is very easy to pick up and play and do lots of stuff with. But uh, this has the ability to build those classic rockets without downloading mods. It's going to run on your mobile devices, on your iPads, or even your phone if you've got very, very tiny fingers. I don't recommend it if all you've got is a phone. You can build those classic rockets. You can try programming them. It It's going to give you a lot of uh, things to do. If you are a self-motivating person that wants to build rockets and fly them, and if you can get through the various peculiarities of the user interface, which seems to make you click a lot more than you need to many of the times. But then, you you know, you get rewarded uh, with images like this, such as crossing the ring plane of a planet when a spacecraft, which is nice and shiny because you textured it that way. And of course, just because it's not Kerbal Space Program doesn't mean that you can't build Kerbal rockets in it. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.